want everyone to give a warm welcome to Sansara Taylor. Thank you. Objective reality is not part of the unnamed logic of whiteness, as is absurdly claimed by Robin DiAngelo, the author of the best-selling White Fragility. Objective reality is also not a part of white supremacist culture, as is argued in a widely circulated tract by Tima Okun. And reason and rationality are not masculinist approaches to knowledge building, as is argued by way too many feminist and black feminist theorists. All of these identity politics-based denials of objective reality and the countless others that could be cited are complete garbage. They are bonkers. They blind you to what is really going on in this world. They blind you to the source of the problems and to this possibility of radical change. They blind you to the fact that a whole different, better world is possible. And whatever the intents of these particular authors and the many more who could be cited, the anti-scientific methodologies that they promote keep you away from figuring out the source of the problems that humanity faces and how we could actually get free. They talk about inclusion, representation, and equity within this system, but they blind you to how we could get rid of this system through an actual revolution and get emancipated. Emancipated from white supremacy, emancipated from patriarchy, emancipated from the American chauvinism that is killing this planet and that is bringing us closer every day to the threat of nuclear war, and emancipated from the capitalist imperialist system that requires these hateful relations among the people. They talk about harm and trauma and mental health days, but they never talk about and still less do they do anything about the Christian fascist, theocratic, white supremacist movement that is moving aggressively to lock in an even more nightmarish version of America. I am going to get into all of that. And I am going to get into how the increasingly unhinged movements to tear down anyone and anything that does not conform to the constantly mutating standards of wokeness is not only useless against this system and the rising fascism, but is actually serving to fuel it. This is all the more intolerable right now, when those who rule over us are deeply divided, when society is being ripped apart, and where we are headed towards something truly terrible, but when all of this also holds the possibility for something truly emancipating to be wrenched out of it, a real revolution. So the question before your generation is inclusion in this parasitic, dying system that is on track to take down the planet's ecosystems and humanity with it, or fighting for the chance to wrench a revolution, to get rid of this system and bring about a different society and world where all of humanity can be get free. It is one or the other, because radical change is coming. It is one or the other, and each of us has a choice to make and where we're gonna stand in this. So today, I'm going to get into the following four questions to get at the essential contrast between woke identity politics on the one hand and science and real revolution on the other. One, does each different identity group and even each different individual have their own truth? Or is there one unified objective reality that all of us can come to understand using the tools of science? Two, is the problem in society marginalization? 
or is it oppression? And why does this matter? Three, is cancel culture a tool that empowers the powerless? Or is it a grotesque expression of the values of this dog-eat-dog -dog system and the profoundly lowered sights of those who cannot see beyond it? And four, should our goal be to guard ourselves with trigger warnings and safe spaces within this monstrous system? Or do we all need to get out of our comfort zones and put it on the line to make a revolution, to get to a society and a world where all of humanity, oppressed humanity everywhere, can finally live safely? After addressing these four questions, I will then examine, with a real-world example, the massive stakes of this contrast. I will talk about and walk through what went down last year in relation to the assault on women's fundamental right to abortion and the overturning of this right. By the end of my talk, I aim to make clear that between woke identity politics on the one hand and real revolution on the other, there are two radically different and opposed understandings of the problem that humanity faces, two radically different and opposed methodologies and moralities, and two radically different and opposed visions of the world that we should be fighting for and that is actually possible. One requires work, intellectual courage, real struggle and sacrifice, but can open the door to human emancipation. The other is degrading, cowardly, and lazy, and only accelerates humanity's current trajectory towards untold horror. And for any of you in the audience who feel you need such things, here is a trigger warning. Tonight, I'm going to challenge you to get out of your comfort zone. Today and going forward, I am going to struggle with you to actually dig into real revolution as it has been re-envisioned by Bob Avakian and as is concentrated in this proclamation, which all of you got on your way in tonight. We are the Revcoms. Critically test this against reality. And while you are doing this and working to understand what is true and what's in humanity's interest, get with and work with the Revcoms for this revolution. In this struggle, you'll be challenged not to remain silent, not to stay in your lane, but to throw in everything you've got to understanding and fighting for a different world. In getting into all this tonight, I will be drawing from and fighting to apply the new synthesis of communism that's been forged by the revolutionary leader, Bob Avakian, including his unparalleled critique of wokedom, or as he has sometimes put it, woke dumb, D-U-M-B. <laughs> Bob Avakian, B.A., became a revolutionary in the 1960s. He worked closely with the leaders of the Black Panther Party in their most revolutionary days. He fought against the Vietnam War and much more. And through this experience, and through struggling with others over what is the problem that humanity faces and what is the solution, he became a revolutionary communist. But unlike so many of his generation in the 1960s, he never made peace with this system. In fact, his heart for the people and his outrage at the way this system grinds up humanity has only deepened. And he has deepened humanity's understanding that all of this is completely unnecessary. That there is a whole different way people could be living here and all over the world through a real revolution. And he has done the work to envision and lay out a blueprint for how a radically new society brought about through this revolution would function and go to work to uproot all forms of exploitation and oppression. And recently, he has led in recognizing and fighting for people to seize on the rare opportunity that is before us now to make this revolution real. So with that, let's dive in. One, do we each have our own truth? Or is there one unified objective reality that anyone can discover using the tools of science? Woke identity politics insists that because different identity groups 
and even different people have different experiences, that therefore everyone has their own truth. And you hear this all the time, your truth, my truth, his truth, her truth. Woke identity politics also claims that only those who directly experience marginalization can truly understand it or what must be done about it. Everyone else, especially old white men, should check their privilege, stay in their lanes, and follow the marginalized. This is wrong. Contrary to the ludicrous claims that I began this speech with, there is one objective reality, and it does actually exist. We all live in it. The planet is warming due to man-driven climate change for all of us. That's not my truth. That's not your truth. That is objectively true. It's true because it corresponds to reality. It can be proven with evidence. And it would be true even if everybody of every identity refused to acknowledge it. Just like the earth was round, even when everybody living thought it was flat. Now, of course, different people do have different experiences, and this matters. But this does not mean that there are different realities. Take the experience of a black woman living in the Harlem housing projects who keeps the binoculars next to her window so that every time her 13-year-old son goes down 16 floors down, she can look out the window with her binoculars and watch him cross the street to the bodega to get a snack or a soda to make sure, because she lives in the everyday terror that this will happen, to make sure that this is not the day that he will be stopped by a cop, brutalized, or even killed. This is a true story. The experience of this black woman tells you a tremendous amount about the society that we live in, and everybody should learn from it. But that is just a start. Experience does not tell you why this is happening. And sometimes, experience can lead you to the wrong conclusions. For example, many black and Latino youth in that same housing project in Harlem think and deeply believe from very real, very direct experience that their enemy is another set of youth who look just like them one or two projects over. To understand what is really true takes science. It takes looking beneath the surface. It takes looking at the larger reality that any particular experience is part of. Does a particular experience concentrate a larger pattern, or is it an anomaly? And if it's part of a pattern, what is that pattern rooted in? All right, we have. All right, everyone. I want to let you know that. There will be a question and answer session. Hold on, hold on, hold on. All right, so I want to welcome the woke crowd, the unthinking knee-jerk woke crowd. Come on in, let me see your flyer. I would like one. Please, I would like one too. Here we go. So to all the people, hold on. To all the people who just came in, I'm really hoping that you'll stick around for the Q and answer. I'm hoping you stick around for the Q&A. And, and if you are, have an argument to make, have the courage of your convictions. All right. All right, so here we go. All right. We're going to ask you to stick around and make an argument. If all you have is your middle finger, it's very unimpressive, my friend. It's quite unimpressive. All right? Here we go. Woke Mob Exhibit A. Thank you. Thank you for your high-level intellectual contribution to this evening's program. We've all learned a great deal from it. All right, so I'm going to take a little detour from my talk. I'm going to return to experience, but I just have to say who is Revcom? Transphobic cult and pyramid scheme recruiting at UCLA. They put this on a flyer, and they're afraid to stand and defend it. And I'll be happy to go at it over any of this. 
And we will talk about it in the Q&A, but this is lies and slander, and it's cheap fear-mongering and disruption and bullshit. But I hope and I expect that most of you came tonight. I'm hoping most of you came tonight because you are sick and tired of people pimping off the struggle against oppression to shut down honest debate and real searching for a real way out. So I'm going to continue, and we're going to get into this and much more in the question and answer. But I was saying experience alone does not tell you what leads to the ongoing terror experienced by this black woman in the housing projects. Experience alone doesn't tell you these black youth and Latino youth in those same projects who their real enemy is. For that, you need science. You need to look at the larger world. You need to look at what any given particular experience is part of. Is it part of a pattern or is it an anomaly? And if it's part of a pattern, what is that pattern rooted in? And can it be changed and how could it be changed by looking at that reality and the roots of it? Experience cannot tell that black woman in Harlem why her grandfather and others like him could find work relatively easily, even though it meant being brutally exploited and backbreaking and dangerous jobs in meat packing and steel mills and auto plants. And why her son and his friends and other youth like him can't find work at all. Experience cannot tell you that. And experience cannot tell the youth who their real enemy is. For that, you need science. And you need to apply science to looking at what has led to this. You need to examine the system of capitalism imperialism that is what the oppression of black people is rooted in and driven forward by. You need to look at the fact that over the last 40 to 50 years, this system has gone through major changes. And it has become more profitable for the capitalist exploiters to exploit people across borders in Mexico, Brazil, and China, and to throw huge numbers of black people out of work and lock them into poverty and conditions of desperation. That is a system that you have to study and understand to understand why the conditions of this woman's grandfather are different than those of his, her son, even as the oppression continues. Science can show you that it is this system that has set up and encouraged the youth in these projects to fight and even kill each other, while also criminalizing them, unleashing their pigs to brutalize them and hunt them down, and lock them up in mass incarceration in prisons that have mushroomed in these same recent decades. Science can also show you how all this can be ended, not by making reforms within this system, but by overthrowing this system. And while we're on this, let me say there is little that reeks more of a condescending savior than the notion that the oppressed do not need to understand and cannot handle more than their own direct experience. Right. About 15 years ago, I spoke on this campus with a dear friend and comrade named Clyde Young, who has since passed away. He was a beautiful person with an incredible heart. He was a black man who came up in the hard ghettos of the Midwest. He spent most of his childhood incarcerated and much of his adult life. But he went on to transform himself into a revolutionary intellectual, into a follower of Bob Avakian, into a scientific revolutionary leader. But this didn't spring from him being on the streets and treated like dirt by this system. That trained him to go out and rob other people. He had to transform himself. He had to fight to do that. He had to fight to take up theory and study, even in the harsh conditions of prison. And others had to struggle with him to break out of the ways that this system puts on him and people like him, the ways of thinking. And there are other people in this room tonight who, like Clyde Young, came up under the boot of this system and have transformed themselves and who will be the first to tell you not to condescend to them and talk to them like children and who will be the first to tell you the enormous respect and appreciation they have for Baba Bacon because he has enough respect for them 
to struggle with them like hell, to become critical thinkers, and to rise to what they are capable of as scientific strategic commanders in a real revolution. But woke lunacy refuses all of this. It stands in the way of this. It tries to shout it down. It does this claiming that all you can really know is your own direct experience. So shut up and follow whoever is black or BIPOC or trans or whatever is most fashionable at the moment. But all this keeps people trapped at the surface, ignorant of and unable to learn the deeper causes of things, left prey to being manipulated by charlatans who commodify oppressed identity to tell you to follow them, fall in line, regardless of where it is they are leading you. Do we really need more of this shit? More of people's oppression being pimped off of and played on while the horrors of this world grind on? No. We need people from every background taking up the tools of science and the rigor of evaluating what everyone has to say up against objective reality and asking, if we follow this, will it lead towards ending oppression or reinforcing it? Two, is the problem in society and the world marginalization or is it oppression? And why does this matter? Wokesters talk constantly about the marginalized. Rarely do they talk about oppression. But if you think that the problem is that some identity groups are cast to the margins of society, then the solution that flows from that is to fight for inclusion of those groups, or at least some from within those groups, in the center of society. And we hear this demand for inclusion all the time and for centering the marginalized. But ask yourself, did it make any difference at all to Tyree Nichols that the five cops who beat him mercilessly as he cried out for his mother and pleaded calmly with them to stop, they beat him to death? Did it matter to him that those five cops were black? No. Did it matter to him that the head of the chief, the police department, was a black female police chief? No. Ask yourself, what about the 12? and 13 and 16 year old immigrant children who were kidnapped by your government at the border. They are being deprived of an education and basic literacy right now. And as you can read about in a searing piece at revcom.us, they are being forced right now to work in slave-like conditions in this country, producing products for Ben and Jerry's, General Motors, Pepsi, J. Crew, and other US corporations. Do you think it would make all this worth it to them, to their parents, if they learned that the high level Biden official who suppressed exposure about this crime was Susan Rice, a black female? Or what about the 526 children in Gaza who were slaughtered in 2014 by Israeli security forces? Do you think they give a damn that this was backed by Hillary Clinton, a female Secretary of State, and Barack Obama, the first black president? Wokesters act as if the advancement of a few individuals from among different oppressed groups within this system or clawing to the top of this system somehow serves the oppressed as a whole. It does not. Now, of course, discrimination at every level of society needs to be fought. But the problem is not marginalization. It is oppression, the pressing down of whole groups of people. And if you recognize that, then the question becomes, what is it going to take to uproot this oppression? Which means you have to look at the system that it is rooted in. It is the system of capitalism and imperialism. And uprooting this oppression requires overthrowing this system. So do you want to continue this insanity of squandering your energies, putting new faces on the same rotten system as it destroys our planet and humanity's future? No. We need to get organized now. 
You need to get with the rev comms now so that we can seize this rare time to actually overthrow this system and get beyond this oppression. Three, is cancel culture a tool that empowers the powerless? Or is it a grotesque expression of the values of this dog-eat-dog -dog system of capitalism imperialism and the profoundly lowered sights of those who cannot see beyond it. Those who defend cancel culture claim it is the way to level the playing field, to allow everyday people to take down the powerful who they otherwise would not be able to touch. Ernest Owens, for example, in his book, The Case for Cancel Culture, calls it a democratic tool that works to liberate us all. This is wrong on so many levels. First, what are the methods and what is the morality of cancel culture? It is to go through someone's entire life to find something they did wrong, whether significant or trivial or maybe fabricated, and then reduce them to it, shame them for it, and throw them away. Rather than looking at the arc of someone's life to determine what is the main thing about them and how are they changing, or how they could change if they were struggled with, they are canceled. Anyone defends them, they get canceled too. All this erases nuance or complexity as well as the presumption of innocence. Accusations alone are treated as proof of guilt. This is revenge. This has nothing to do with justice. And these days people get canceled not just for doing something wrong, but for daring to do things that are very good while being the, quote, wrong identity. Dana Schutz painted a powerful piece commemorating the open casket of Emmett Till. And this work was included in the 2017 Whitney Biennial. But then some woke hustlers came out and trashed her because she was white and it was not her story to tell and demanded not only that the artwork be taken down, but that it be destroyed. Destroying artwork that you don't agree with? You know who else does that? The Taliban. And as much as their particular dogma might differ from the wokesters, the fundamental methodology is not any different. But let's look deeper. What is the underlying premise of cancel culture? It's that people cannot change. And if people cannot change, then the world can't change. How convenient for this system and for the woke lackeys clawing to get a piece of this system. But this is not true. If it were true, Detroit Red, who went around robbing people, never could have become Malcolm X. If it were true, US soldiers who witnessed and even carried out horrific atrocities in Vietnam could never have returned to this country and at great risk to themselves told the world the truth about what they witnessed and then gone down to the White House and thrown their medals over the fence in one of the most heroic and courageous anti-war acts of their generation. And this kind of transformation can be true on an even bigger scale as we come together to fight to change the world through a real revolution and change ourselves in the process. So do you really want to feed this destructive, degrading, demoralizing dynamic of cancel culture? Or will you stand up to it with largeness of mind and generosity of spirit and work together to change ourselves as we struggle to change the larger world. And four, should the goal be to guard ourselves with trigger warnings and safe spaces within this monstrous system? Or do we all need to get out of our comfort zone and put it on the line to make a revolution and bring about a world that is actually safe for the masses of oppressed humanity here and around the world? A professor at Hamlin University in St. Paul warned her students, gave them the option to leave, and then showed a piece of artwork that depicted the Prophet Muhammad in an art history class. You know what happened next? She got fired 
because some students were offended. Raphael, who opened tonight's program, one time took this poster of people whose lives were stolen by police out to UC Berkeley a few years back trying to get students to stand up against this unending atrocity. You know what happened? Some students tried to drive him off campus. They said they were triggered by this. Never mind the actual people killed by actual triggers. Just don't make me look. It's too upsetting to me. I was once part of a group of people who was ejected by police under threat of arrest from a so-called reproductive rights conference at Hampshire College. What was our crime? So we had a table. We were registered, part of the conference. And we're talking about the atrocities done to women, the assault on women's right to abortion, the massive sexual slavery that goes on by the millions and millions around the world. And some student came up to us and wanted to argue that sex work is really empowerment and agency. And we refused to agree with this. We didn't assault them. We didn't insult them. We just didn't go along with the, something we did not think was true. But then they started crying. Oh my god, five alarm emergency, call the police. <laughs> but calling oppression, agency, and empowerment does not change the fact that it is oppression. And calling the police to protect you from having to look at reality does not change that reality. It only keeps it going. It is time for students and young people to stop acting like soft crybabies. Here, here, I want to quote from Bob Avakian in a very important work he did called Something Terrible or Something Truly Emancipating. He said, enough of woke folk who act as if, as if it is actually oppressed people, or as they like to call it, the marginalized, who are fragile beings, constantly need in the protection of safe spaces, lest they fall apart at the mere appearance of a triggering phenomenon. And since when are universities and other institutions supposed to be places where you are safe, not just from physical violence of one kind or another, and from overtly threatening or clearly degrading verbal assaults, but from ideas? statements, etc., that simply make you uncomfortable. How are you going to change the world if you are in danger of falling apart at things like that? And he goes on, Bob Avakin does, based on real world experience of his own in the 1960s and broader understanding, he says, in any real struggle to deal with any real oppression, up against powerful enforcers of that oppression, you are going to have to face the prospect of real sacrifice, including the prospect of being physically attacked. And if you think you can carve out a little safe enclave, and that this is somehow going to lead to any kind of significant change in society, you are full of illusions and delusions." End quote. And here, let's be honest. And let's be honest, the little enclaves of safe space that woke folk are fighting for within this country rest on the horror this country inflicts around the world. They rest on the Congolese children slaving in mines to extract the coal tan that makes their phones work. They rest on the Bangladeshi women trapped in dangerous hellhole factories who are stitching the clothes that they are wearing, and they rest on the migrants who left children thousands of miles away and risked their lives in deserts and jungles and up against border patrol to pick their fruit. But you see, for all their endless talk of privilege, the one privilege the woke identity politics hustlers rarely talk about is American privilege. The privilege <laughs> The privilege that comes from living in the USA, a country that plunders the world and whose wealth and power rests on brutal exploitation and oppression throughout the world, 
backed up through massive violence enforced by the US military. These woke hustlers want all they can get of that kind of privilege. Is that what you want? Or do you want to end this? So having addressed these four questions, I want to move now and take some time to examine how all this played out in the face of what can only be described as the most massive assault on women, women's lives, in at least three generations, the overturning of the right to abortion last year. I want to compare what we, the Revcoms, did, the followers of Bob Avakian, versus what the woke identity politics hustlers did in response to this attack. So I want to start with our approach to the truth. For our part, we started by making an analysis of reality. What was actually happening and why? And here it helped profoundly that Bob Avakian has been ahead of the curve for decades in analyzing the threat posed by Christian fascism and how their attack on abortion is deadly serious and is a concentration of the fight over whether women, yes, women, will be enslaved or emancipated. And more recently, as I mentioned, Bob Avakian analyzed the larger situation that this fight over abortion is happening within, a rare time when this whole country is splitting apart. This country is more divided than it has been since before the Civil War. And the crisis it is currently going through will not be resolved within the norms and the structures that have held this society together since then. Currently, this is headed towards disaster, but it also holds a heightened chance to make a real revolution. This is because millions and millions of people's lives and assumptions about this country are being jolted and torn apart. The ripping away of abortion rights is one example of this. It is forcing many people to question things in new ways. Bob Avakian told the truth about this, boldly in the major talk that I quoted from earlier, something terrible or something truly emancipating and in other works, and we Revcom spread this. And we also boldly told the truth about what's concentrated in the particular fight over abortion, that forcing women to have children against their will by denying them abortion is female enslavement. In contrast, the wokesters refused to confront this reality. They downplayed the threat to abortion, and they attacked us for stating it. They called us racist for calling it female enslavement. But what else do you call the state violently, forcibly controlling somebody's body, women's bodies, in the most intimate, life-shattering, and life-lasting way? And if you really want to fight against racism when it comes to abortion, how about standing up against the fact that those who will be hit hardest among those hit hardest will be black and brown women. The wokesters accused us of fear-mongering for using wire coat hangers and bloody pants to portray how women die without access to legal abortion, even though this is true, and there are women being sent home from hospitals right now to bleed out and risk their lives because of abortion bans. They called us transphobic, and it continues, and TERFs, for simply using the word women, rather than pretending like the assault on abortion was motivated by some genderless attack on people with uteruses. And this is bad faith bullshit. Here I want to cite just one of many places where Bob Avakian made very clear how we see this attack and trans rights. He wrote, of course, in the case of the extremely small number of females who have transitioned or are transitioning to males, but who re retain female reproductive organs and might get pregnant, they should have the right to abortion and to decent health care overall without any stigma or discrimination. And in general, attacks directed against trans people must be actively, vigorously opposed. But in terms of its essential purpose and objective, the attack on the right to abortion is not aimed at trans people. The attack on the right to abortion is a move to further intensify the already horrific oppression of women, denying them control of their lives and their very bodies, reducing them to breeders of children, 
cruelly subordinating them to men in a patriarchal male supremacist society. Forced motherhood is, in fact, female enslavement." End quote. So next, I want to contrast the political program of us, the Revcoms, versus the Wokesters. And this is all real. This all played out just in the last year. For our part, we recognize that if people did not fight this attack, it would guarantee horrors for women and girls. And it would also set back the prospects for revolution by allowing people to be beaten down and demoralized without a fight. But conversely, we understood that if the pent-up fury of millions and millions of women and girls at thousands of years of patriarchal degradation and oppression were unleashed and millions more stood with them, that we had a fighting chance to stop the fascist Supreme Court from taking this right away. And that we had to take this chance and through waging this fight, we could actually strengthen people to go forward for revolution. This was a real prospect and possibility. It was not a guarantee. It would have been hard, but it was possible. And it might have happened had these woke hustlers and the Democratic Party not attacked and stood in the way of it. But we waged real struggle even in the face of these attacks. I reached out to others from very diverse political perspectives, and we came together and initiated a movement with the green bandana, Rise Up for Abortion Rights. And our mission was to unite all who could possibly be united to take to the streets a mass, nonviolent, relentless protest to stop the Supreme Court from taking this right from half of society. And we, through courageous truth-telling and bold, disruptive protests, forced awake millions in this society. Some of us went to jail, myself and others, putting it on the line to wake others up to fight. We waged struggle. But for their, and we actually did bring forward tens of thousands of people to fight against this, including many, many furious young women who saw their whole futures and lives on the line. And in contrast, the wokesters capitulated in advance. They told people the lie that it didn't matter if the Supreme Court overturned abortion rights because they just helped people with uteruses travel to other states to get abortions. And besides, they'd spread the abortion pill so people could manage their own abortions at home, and they insisted delusionally that this would be impossible to suppress. These woke hustlers focused attention on the handful of people who could be helped in this way, while joining the fascists in erasing the masses of women and girls who are already suffering and more who will come behind them. I am talking about, on average, at least 5,000 women a month who have been denied access to abortion in this country who otherwise would have had an abortion. And I am talking about the millions and millions more who live with the threat of that hanging over their heads right now in 14 states and many more in the balance. So finally, let's compare and contrast the principles and the methods and morality of the Revcoms versus the Wokesters. For our part, we fought hard for people to look at and understand what was giving rise to this assault. Where was it coming from? What was it rooted in? What would it take to stop it? And to debate this out with principle. And Bob Avakian modeled this more than anybody else with article after article going into this. And Bob Avakian also fought for and modeled the kind of standards we should have as we struggle with each other over analysis of the problem and strategy to fight it. And I want to quote from one of the places he did this. He said, this struggle needs to be waged in a principled way not descending into personal attacks or engaging in slanders of people with whom you disagree, but honestly examining the substance of different approaches, where they will lead, and whether they will strengthen or weaken the critical fight for the right to abortion and for a more just society overall." End quote. But for their part, the wokesters refused to engage any of these arguments. Instead, they descended precisely into personal attacks and slanders. They spread lies and reactionary anti-communism. They waged a full, all-out character assassination campaign against Bob Avakian and against myself. You know how in Monopoly, 
There's the get out of jail free card. Well, these woke hustlers played the get out of thought free card by accusing and smearing Bob Avakian as some kind of a cult leader and me of some kind of a groomer for this cult. As scary people, you should stay away from, run away from, not think about what we're saying, lest we assert our mind control. <laughs> this is a manipulative, unprincipled, and cowardly way to keep people from engaging or thinking critically about what we're actually saying. They couldn't make an argument against it. They didn't want to stand up and air that out, so instead they lied, slandered, attacked, and fear-mongered. And shamefully, in this culture where way too many people follow rumors rather than evidence, and where people go along even with things they disagree with rather than sticking their neck out and risk getting canceled themselves, way too many people let themselves get played by this and fell away. But did any of this woke opportunism reflect the truth? No, it was lies and bullying and intimidation to back up those lies. Did any of this help protect abortion rights? No, it strengthened the fascist assault by taking a wrecking ball to the one movement that was leading people to stand up and by erasing women and therefore disorienting people as to what was actually at stake. And did all this tearing down of Bob Avakian and myself and the people from different perspectives and rise up for abortion rights based on the lie that we were TERFs and transphobes, did any of this do anything to stop the more than 500 anti-trans laws that have been introduced or passed just in the last year? No. These, <laughs> these scurrilous, dishonest attacks aided the genocidal assault on trans people by getting decent people caught up in fighting friends rather than enemies. And it kept people away from the one solution that is the source to all of this oppression, a real revolution. And all of this stank of the murderous tactics of the FBI and political police of the 1960s against the leaders of the Black Panther Party and against other revolutionaries. The FBI fabricated rumors to create divisions. They spread lies and slanders to isolate revolutionary leaders. They carried out cold-blooded assassinations, and they sent people into long bids in prison based on false charges. Everyone who cares about justice, everyone who cares about the truth, and about the ability of people to learn from each other, debate with each other, and unite where they can to fight for a better world, has to stand up against this and start setting different standards now. <laughs> but you see, the woke hustlers don't want you thinking about or debating all this, especially not revolution. Because for all their talk and posturing, at the end of the day, they are loyal to this system. Their program and their horizons are limited to fighting for a bigger place within it. And they are fighting to channel your outrage against oppression into getting them a bigger seat at the table and a bigger slice of this system's spoils. And the more that reality refuses to conform to their brittle, out-of-touch dictates, the more fanatically they lash out. And the more ludicrously they do this, the more the fascists seize on it to caricature and attack every real cry for justice. And the more the fascists escalate, the more the wokesters retreat from and lash out against anyone who dares to wage the struggle that must be waged against this. And all this feeds the wider silence and passivity of millions of decent people who need to be standing up searching for answers and fighting for a different future now. This woke lunacy is not just a dead end. It is actively doing harm. It is time. In fact, it is long past time to stand up to this and reject it. It is time to lift our sights to and fight for the radically different society and world that is possible through an actual revolution, to seize the unique, unique chance to bring about what is envisioned 
in this Constitution for the New Socialist Republic in North America, authored by Bob Avakian. And if you haven't read this, then you really don't know what is possible. Imagine living in a society where the economy was not geared towards profit above all else at the cost of the planet and billions of people, but was instead geared towards meeting people's needs, repairing the environment, and serving the fight for liberation the world over. Imagine if new ideas, especially ideas that challenge tradition and authority, even the authority of those leading the new society, including, yes, the communists, were not shot down, but was engaged and debated, measured up against reality and whether it could help move society forward. Imagine a system that did not require and immediately put an end to the brutal murder by police and occupying armies around the world. Imagine a society that gave backing to women and differently gendered people as they fought to uproot every vestige of remaining patriarchal attitudes and relations. To scientists and youth innovating new forms of environmentally sustainable development. To artists and others striking out in new directions. And to a culture where people's diversity was celebrated at the same time that our community and shared future was fostered. Imagine all of this as part of a society being led to move together with the people of the world towards real emancipation. Dig into this Constitution. Debate it. Spread it. Measure it up against the exploiter's U.S. Constitution. And tune in every week to the RNL, the Revolution Nothing Less show, to learn more about and connect with this revolution. And right now, as the horrors of this system are mounting, and the fascists are seizing on this crisis that is ripping through society, do not stand aside. Do not leave here tonight thinking, wow, I'm glad somebody's speaking up about this. Get with the Revcoms. Sign up tonight. Spend your summer learning about and working with us to spread this revolution everywhere. And in moving to conclude, I want to read and ask you to take to heart these words from Bob Avakian. Instead of staying in your lane and going for self, while this system is moving to even more decisively crush any hope for a world worth living in, people need to be looking at the bigger picture, focusing on the greater interests of humanity and the possibility for a far better world and acting to make this a reality. Instead of finding excuses to go along with the way things have been, standing apart from or even bad-mouthing the revolution, people need to get with this revolution and not throw away the rare opportunity to be part of bringing something much better into being. Instead of snarking and sniping at each other, being divided by identities, people should be working to unite everyone from every part of society who can be united in the fight against oppression and injustice with the goal of putting an end to this system that is the source of this oppression and injustice." End quote. So I am calling on you, each of you here tonight, to answer this challenge, to make your life really count for something at this time of radical change, one way or the other, to think, to dream, and dare to fight for a future where all of humanity is free, to step into this revolution now while the future is being shaped. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sansara. Um, in just a moment, about five minutes, we'll open it up for the question and answer. Um, but before we do that, I want to remind everyone that this event tonight is just the beginning of a major effort to take on the whole framework of woke identity politics on college campuses and beyond as a key part of bringing forward a new generation of revolutionaries and putting real revolution on the map. So we are calling on each of you here tonight to help make this event a springboard to reach even more people nationwide and impact all of society. One key way you can do that is by donating. 
Uh, the information for how to donate is in the packet you guys got at the door. Um, there's a fundraising letter from Sansara Taylor in it. It's got a Venmo address. You can also donate on PayPal at revcom.us. Um, and I'm going to ask you to dig deeply and donate generously. This event costs a lot of money, and this speaking tour will cost a lot more. But think about the powerful speech you just heard and how crucial it is for this message to connect, especially with young people. A lot of people right now are groaning and grumbling about woke lunacy, but no one is taking it on the way that Sansara Taylor and the Revcoms are. Do you, yeah. Do you know how many students just in the last couple weeks on this campus have told us how sick and tired they are of this woke identity politics? How it suppresses like much needed conversations, conversations shuts down debate? How suffocating and paralyzing it is to be told to stay in your lane and not speak out and not fight against injustice and oppression just because it doesn't affect you directly? Do you know how many professors we've talked to who tell us that they feel like they're walking on eggshells and afraid they might get canceled, targeted and canceled if they say the wrong thing? You know, I spoke with a professor just a couple days ago who told me he wanted, he, he would love to invite us into his classroom to announce the event, but he was afraid to do so. Think about the human potential, the conscience, the questioning, the desire to act for a better world that's being sat on, intimidated, misdirected into, in harmful ways. And think about the fact that you here are lucky enough to be in the room right now, to be among the small handful in this society who are hearing the power of this speech from Sansara Taylor and learning what we're doing on this tour. That professor should give $500, $1,000 to enable this message to reach tens of thousands and soon millions of people. And you need to do the same, even as you're sorting out what exactly you think of everything you've heard tonight, what you think about the revolution and the new communism Sansara was talking about, you need to support this speaking tour. You need to support this speech getting out everywhere, and you need to support this speaker, Sansara Taylor, because <laughs> not everyone is intimidated by this. Some, there's someone out here who's, a, who's not afraid to stand up to the bully. So whether you can donate $25 or $2,500, your donation is contributing to, to changing the whole atmosphere in society. So dig deep and donate generously. As Sansara was saying, radical change is coming. Right now, things are headed somewhere very terrible. You know, we can see World War III looming. We can see climate change at a crossing a threshold and a tipping point. Um, we see American fascism and potential civil war close at hand. Uh, but something better is possible if we seize the moment and get organized. So here I'm going to ask you to do four things right now. One, pull out your cell phones, like actually pull them out now, <laughs> and follow the Revolution Nothing Less show on YouTube. Go to youtube.com slash the revcoms. If you open your packet, you'll see right here on the front page, the website, youtube.com slash the revcoms. And subscribe. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the notification bell. This is a show that comes out every week. It's about what's happening in the, in the world, why it's happening, and where the real interests of humanity lie. And you can also watch the, in, the new interviews from Baba Vakian that Sansara and Andy Z did with Baba Vakian on that show. And there's people here filming for the Revolution Nothing Less show. Pete, can you raise your hand? And pros over here, you can talk to them afterwards. They're getting, they want to get interviews with people um, about you know, your feedback on the event tonight. Um, two. As Sansara said, join the Revolution Club this summer. Learn more about this revolution and work together with others to actually be part of putting revolution on the map. Um, once you're, especially once you're graduated have, or once you finish uh, the semester and have a little bit more time, you should really dedicate your summer to being part of this revolution. So you can talk to Michelle Chai over there with the Los Angeles Revolution Club. Stand up. And Luna and Chantel are at the door. Luna, raise your hand. Talk to them about the Revolution Club afterwards. And there's a sign-up form in your packet where you can sign up for all this. Three, 
Get involved with the Woke Lunacy versus Real Revolution speaking tour and be part of spreading this nationwide. So, yeah, sign, sign up for it. Sansara Taylor should be on podcasts. She should be getting into the media. She, she should be getting on Joe Rogan and Bill Maher and debating this with everyone, you know? But we need your help to make that happen. Lastly, tomorrow, let's continue the conversation. Uh, learn more about this revolution. We can get into discussing the We Are the RevCom statement that's in your packet. Um, and we're going to do that five o'clock tomorrow at Laval Commons. So join us, and I hope uh, everyone to see you guys there. So without further ado, let's uh, get into the question and answer session. All right. Um, why don't we start uh, right here? Go ahead. Uh, we're going to bring a mic to you so okay. everybody can hear. Um, thank you. No, it doesn't work, actually. But I don't think it's on. It does? There you it go. Does. Thank you very much for this talk. Uh, I had a question. For, now I doubt I'm a walk star or not. Like, but like, I have a question for you. Is like, um, from my country, France, like, walk has been a, a concept, a lexicon that has been constructed by, constructed by the conservatives to discredit like anti-racist, like, or queer or anti-patriarchal uh, thought. And I wondered how can you construct and build a left-wing communist revolution if you use the lexicon and the words uh, that has been constructed by conservative people? And that's basically my question. Like, do you like do you, do you think those words are like who constructed those wor words in America? And how can revolution be thought with the words that are not constructed by Marxists, for instance? Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start by using a bunch of words that were not constructed by Marxists, like you use the microphone, we didn't make up that word, she's walking up the stairs, we didn't make up that word. Words describe, if they're, if they're useful, they describe something that's objectively real. And I start, and I think we all need to start, if we want to change the world, with reality. You can't start with who used the word, who made it up. Is woke a phenomenon? And we say in this big piece up here, Woke is a destructive force in the ethical, moral, intellectual, cultural life of society. We say in this piece, woke in its roots came out of the black vernacular and mainly meant being aware of racial oppression, but it has long since morphed into something that is very radically different. And when we talk about woke lunacy, we're talking about the people who stormed in here but don't have the courage to come and make an argument for their position. They just try to shut it down. We're talking about the canceling and erasing of murals. This is not something that's been invented by the fascists. It's being seized on by the fascists, and they are clumping all kinds of things that are legitimate cries for justice as also woke and, und and deserving of attack. But because they use it and also misuse it does not mean it's not a real phenomenon. We have to start with reality. And if we don't do that, then we will never address what's really going on. Um, I mean, there's actually a lot of preoccupation with language and word changing and who made up a word and where does it, who sign what the word signifies. And we say also in here, the last thing I'll say on this is word changing and obsession over words is no substitution for world changing and looking at the actual reality. So woke is a real phenomenon. We have to name it because it's, being, it's doing something highly destructive in all the ways I described, and it's doing it in the name of the oppressed. And when fascists do destructive things, a lot of decent people go, oh, that's outrageous. But when people do this woke lunacy in the name of the marginalized or the oppressed, and they marshal their and commodify oppressed identity, they intimidate and silence decent people. And so it's really doing a destructive thing. It has to be named. It has to be called out. Um, yeah, right here. Hey, um, I didn't come here with an agenda. Um, I'm just a little bit disappointed with a couple of things, and I want to address it super calmly. Um, I think you build a foundation of your speech on working against identity politics. Mm -hmm. Yet, um, I think so conveniently, and it was kind of ignorant, that all of your examples of oppression or people going through struggle were all from the black community. So if you could so conveniently use one specific ethnicity to kind of propagate your ideals, is that not identity politics in itself? Uh, that's my first question. My second question is, um, you spoke about how 
um, oh, the upward mobility of certain people in marginalized communities doesn't matter because they're kind of uh, still propagating like these oppressive structures. But since you're so empathetic to the, the rights and the, the, the ways that black people feel, are you disregarding the, the kind of role models that Nelson Mandela was or like Martin Luther King was or J even like a Jay-Z was, right? Like people that made progress in their communities and inspired people to do better are somehow not, not appreciated now because they're like, like fulfilling someone, some oppressor's needs, which didn't make sense to me. Um, I feel like, yes, there's a lot of stupidity on the far left that needs to be addressed, but fighting it with more stupidity is not going to help, right? We need to fight with, cons with, with compromise and reason. And just throwing the word science around doesn't make it rational. It's just like, no, no, like, I'm sorry if this sounds offensive, but I study science and engineering, and nothing was scientific in the first half of the conversation. It was just, oh, I'm going to abuse the fact that one certain community went through a lot of bad things in my country, and I'm going to use that to kind of propagate what I feel about them, right? Which, which sounded a little ignorant, in my opinion. So I just want to know your views on that. Well, let me start with your first question, which is that you allege I only spoke about what black people face in this society, and that that's a form of identity politics. In fact, it is not. First of all, I spoke about the Bangladeshi women in the sweatshops sewing our clothes. I talked about women who've been forced to have children against their will in that form of enslavement. I spoke about trans people who have faced over 500 laws this year introduced or passed. Not to mention the terror that's enforced against them. I spoke about what happens on this planet as a whole as it is heating due to the destruction of climate change driven forward by the system of capitalism and imperialism. So I've, if you missed all that, I'm not surprised if you also missed some of the scientific undergirdings of it. But to be fair, I will walk through it again. I speak about black people in a very pronounced way when we come to revolution because the exploitation, the enslavement, the dehumanization and the, and the and the degradation that's been inflicted on black people is foundational to this society and this system. And that is scientifically a fact. It's evidence-based. The wealth of this country, the territorial reach of this country, the military strength of this country got its roots in American slavery, the chattel slavery of black people. And then on that foundation, the ideology of white supremacy, of black inferiority, has, was propagated it was made a, a, a bedrock of one of the glues of this society, and it has been woven into this society ever since. The forms of oppression have changed. It took a civil war to end slavery, but then what happened? After not even 10 years of reconstruction, where black people were brought into some rights within this country, that was betrayed. The troops were pulled out, and black people were re-enslaved in new conditions, slavery by another name, sharecropping for generations, surf-like conditions enforced through terror, lynch mob terror and violence. And the troops were pulled out to go and finish off the extermination of the native peoples, okay? Then, another generation comes up in the face of changes in the US economy and the need to pull black people out of the South and into the factories. Black people stood up and they waged struggle in a civil rights movement. They gave their lives, they stood up. White people stood with them. They went down from the north and stood with them. This upended Jim Crow. It was heroic that many did just unbelievably brave things. And then that was dismantled. And what did this system come back with? A new Jim Crow of mass incarceration that has ground up millions of black lives. So when I tell the story, this is science, when I tell the story of a black woman in Harlem with binoculars next to her window watching in terror every time her 12-year-old, 13-year-old son crosses the street because of what police do every day, every day to black people, every fucking day, when I talk about that, that is a particular that concentrates a huge reality that is defining to this country. And that's scientifically true. It's evidence-based. It's woven into the fabric of this society. It's culture, it's economics, and it's global reach. And so we could debate. If you want to argue that's not scientific, bring some evidence. If you didn't hear the science, then please. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Tell me that it's a marginal thing. Tell me that to talk about that, I'm pimping off of it. I'm acknowledging reality. You want to say it's not defining to this country that we shouldn't talk about it? I want you to talk about it. I am talking about it, yeah. Okay, so, just the fact that something actually happened or is true, yeah. doesn't, anything that's empirically based is not science, right? It's, not, it's, like, it's like saying anything that's true is a scientifically, like, it's science, it's not. 
So you, I understand. Okay. To say. Okay. Let me let me help. Let me help. Oh, go ahead. Maybe he should get the mic. I understand that your 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 point is I want to be building arguments based on reason and rationale. Here, take the mic just so it gets. I understand that your point is I want to be building arguments on reason and rationale. But that doesn't mean that it's scientific, and, and that doesn't mean that it's, it's false or wrong. Okay. I'm saying that um, the validity of your argument doesn't increase by throwing the word science out. It's well, all I, I, okay, so I would, I would argue that science actually can be applied to all of reality, mm -hmm. not just narrowly in engineering or in the natural sciences. No, this is important. What you're raising is widely felt, it's widely believed, it's widely taught, I'm sure, on this campus, that you can apply science to medicine, to nature, to the natural world. There's the hard sciences, but when you get to social reality, it's just opinions, it's experience, whatever. No, you can apply science to everything. Everything that is part of reality, which societies are, can be analyzed scientifically. Yeah. All science means, in a universal sense, is it, it's an evidence-based process. You gather evidence about reality, and you look for the deeper causes of the patterns in reality, and you can apply that to a society, just like you can apply it to a rainforest, just like you can apply it to a virus. You can say, what is the most defining thing about any given society? What undergirds it? What are the laws and its functioning? And a scientific analysis of this society says the most defining thing about this country is it's a capitalist, imperialist mode of production that all of our needs are met through exploitation and people laboring in conditions all over the world to get the food we need, the clothes we wear, the pens we use, the microphones, all of this is created through global networks of production. And that all of our cultures, all of our ways of living, all of our ways of relating, grow out of and have to reflect and, and, and more or less correspond to that. And so when we live in a society that where the exploitation and oppression of black people has been woven into that mode of production all the way down to today, it leads to the culture and the society and the kind of police terror that we have today. That's, that's applying science to a social contradiction. Yeah. And so that's one example. I, there was other questions he raised. You want to say something? Yeah, and in, in an unscientific approach to society would say, look, here in America, we're all a bunch of individuals. You know, there's some social mobility. It's not like uh, under feudalism, right? Where, you know, you're born, you're a peasant, you're born a peasant, you die a peasant, or you're born a noble. Under capitalism, there's a little bit of social mobility. So, hey, Jay-Z, you know, he made it. He's, he's a billionaire. So therefore, in America, anyone can make it. No, that would be a, and, and this is some great victory for black people, right? Jay-Z, a great victory for black people, big pimpin'. That's a great, a great role model for, 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 oppre for oppressed people. You know, this is, this is how they fool you. This is how they fool you in this society. You know, they say, oh, in America, anyone can make it. This system is grinding up the lives of the masses of people. It's a capitalist system with white supremacy built into it. The masses of people are being, having their lives terrorized and ground up here and even more so all over the world. And yet they hold up these few individuals who make it and say, look, in America, anyone can make it. And then they use that to say, oh, if you didn't make it, it's your own fault. And yeah. this is how people like Jay-Z, and she gave the example of Barack Obama, this is how they get used. In some ways, Obama was worse for black people than George Bush was. Obama got up there and said, and, and on Father's Day, and blamed black people for not pulling up their pants and not being, and being absent fathers. Mm -hmm. You know, he got up there after the police broke Freddie Gray's neck in Baltimore and called the people who stood up, you know, who stood up in the streets, he called them thugs. Imagine if Bush had done that. Imagine if Trump had done that. Everyone would say, it's a fucking racist ass thing to say. You know, but, but Obama could get away with it. See, this is how they use people like this. And if you're, if you're putting forward these people as models and examples, anyone can make it, then you're getting played by the system and you're taking an unscientific approach. Okay. Uh, Maybe over here? Yeah. Yes, uh, I appreciate the meeting today. Uh, my question is, Speaker, considering the current living conditions many Americans endure and the disregard by the current Biden administration, such as inflation, housing, gas, and food, all while sending $80 billion to fund a war 5,000 miles away that brings us closer to nuclear annihilation, 
and with the backing of figures like Bernie Sanders and Republican neocons like Lindsey Graham, Mike Pompeo, and Ron DeSantis, shouldn't the American people seriously consider seeking a 2024 election candidate who breaks free from the conventional Democrat and Republican status quo? After all, we need to stop nuclear escalation, give power to a movement by and for the working American people and uh, who are against the elites, a movement so vocal against the ruling class that they are enemy public number one for the CIA and FBI. What if I told you that this movement, this revolution, is the MAGA movement? I would tell you that you're very wrong. <laughs> The, look, you can list, I'll, I'll tell you, you can list, you can list a thousand and one things wrong with Biden. I mean, 1996 crime bill that is part of the mass incarceration, the fact that he is taking us and playing nuclear brinkman, brinksmanship with Russia in Ukraine and moving us closer to war with China. You can name a million things wrong with Biden. And it will not make that white supremacist, fascist feces, Donald Trump, a hero of the people. Yes. Okay? <laughs> Donald Trump, who has said, and people have to take this seriously, this is a bunch of, you know, he has said, I'm running for, first of all, they carried out, they staged a coup attempt. And you know what a failed coup attempt is? It is a dress rehearsal. And very few of them face serious charges, and most of the people who stood up against that have now been purged from the Republican Party. And when Donald Trump was at CNN Town Hall, he said, I will be your retribution. I'm coming back, I will be your retribution in 2024. He, again, refused to accept an election he loses, and he has a social base that is even more armed to the teeth, even more fanatical, even more ready to use violence to, to purge America of those they deem less than human. Donald Trump once again upheld ripping children from their parents' arms and caging them in that town hall. These are crimes against humanity, and they are being prepared in the offing right now. And the people in this country and all the decent people in this room better take note. When I say we need to make a choice because radical change is coming one way or the other, I'm not challenging you to step into the revolution as a lifestyle choice, as a timeless thing. Get into this, because this is our thing. We need to build it up. We are moving in a very dangerous direction that this man just spoke about, MAGA. MAGA, the guy who said he wanted to take the troops and shoot protesters during Black Lives Matter, MAGA, with the Republican Abbott governor in Texas who just pardoned a guy who shot and killed and was convicted of murder for killing somebody who stood up in the Black Lives Matter protest, convicted in a Texas court of murder. And he said, I'm gonna pardon you. Giving the green light to that kind of slaughter. This is what one half the country is preparing for. And the other half the country, and this is why we have to struggle against this woke shit, is caught up canceling each other over pronouns, obsessing with their feelings and their identities, and seeking safe spaces and trigger warnings, which are bullshit. There is no safe space in a nuclear war. There is no safe space in a fascist America. And there is no safe space for most people on this planet today. So I'm challenging those of you who are not deluded into MAGA bullshit. <laughs> to actually step into the revolution and spread this revolution, get organized with this now, while we still have a chance, while we have an opportunity to wrench this in a different direction. I'm putting that challenge very much to all of you who are still sorting out your thinking to sign up tonight, to get organized with us, to get into this, we are the Revcom statement, to spread it to join the Revolution Club, to join this tour and help spread this tour, because we have to wake up so many others in this country who are sleeping through this right now. So that's what I want to say about that. You want to yeah. say anything? No, we'll go to another question. Um, I kind of want to get this guy in the t-shirt, and then we'll come in front. Yeah, they both got t-shirts. OK. No, the grayish, purplish, bluish t-shirt and the ponytail. There we go. And then we'll come down in front. I promise I won't. <laughs> um, I, I appreciated um, everything you said against the woke ideology. Um, 
my first comment is I, d I still don't really see the connection between anti-wokeism and communism. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, uh, you are very correct in espousing an evidence-based approach to pretty much everything, especially policy. So what is the evidence that communism is a better form of government than what we currently have? Okay, those are two very good questions. Thank you. Um, the reason, okay, first on the relationship between woke and communism. Yeah, yeah, anti-woke, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, anti-wokeism and communism is woke right now today in this society among decent people, among people who actually do care about white supremacy, who oppose it, who don't care about it with a kind of a happy feeling, but care about it like they actually know this is a horror, who care about what's being done to women, who care about the planet, the health of the environment and the ecosystems, the, peop the decent people. Wokeism is the dominant form of accommodation to this system. And it is the dominant form of intimidation of people from standing up against this system. And that's why we have to take it on. Because people as they are right now, the decent people really are caught up in, and, and it's, it's, in, it's like an infestation on the college campuses in hiding from reality. That's why I gave the examples of him taking this poster out. And the students, instead of saying, let's stand up and fight to stop this, they said, get off our campus, you're upsetting me. You know, a few years back at Antioch, a man who made a film about Juanita Young, whose son Malcolm Ferguson was killed by police, went to Antioch College, showed this film. And this was before the big uprisings that people where this made it in everybody's public conscience. And it was the first time these students were hearing about this horrendous murder that's so systematic and systemic. And instead of getting into that and what needs to be done, instead they all debated the fact and decided that this white filmmaker had no right to make the film. And that's all they wanted to talk about. It's a form of avoiding the struggle. And avoiding the fact that it does take struggle, it does take risk, it does take getting out of your comfort zone. And it does take thinking scientifically. And the other thing that, about wokeism, and it flows out of the relativism, the postmodernism that is so, um, almost universally taught and enforced, is there is a denial of objective reality. It is where I began, that objective reality is part of white supremacist culture, that it's a white European male construct, that it's a form of violence to say that we all have to be evidence-based in what we're saying. Let's just go with the experience and worship the experience of the oppressed. And it's intersectionality, centering the marginalized. Yes, people experience intersecting forms of oppression. That's true. Just like people with diseases might have intersecting diseases and symptoms. But that doesn't tell you anything about what's giving rise to it, what's beneath the surface. And the whole framework of postmodernism, intersectionality, and in its virulent form, wokeism, is anti-scientific. It is against looking beneath the surface. It is, and the wokeism is anti-rational because it shuts down discourse. Who are you to say that? You're not XYZ identity. It's like the guy who wrote the article saying, actually, James Webb wasn't a homophobe. Here's the evidence. I looked it up. It's a misquote. I found the evidence. It was from this other person. They, instead of going, oh, wow, we had the wrong guy, somebody wrote an article against him like three days later that said, the straights are here to save us, and said he had no right to speak about it because he wasn't gay. It's anti-rational. It's an so this is it's both anti-rational, anti-scientific, that's one, not both. It's both anti-scientific and it's anti-revolutionary because it's about fighting for your, a place within this system rather than looking at the roots of this oppression and the need to overthrow this system. So, which brings me to the second question you asked, very well placed. Um, what is the evidence that communism would be a better system? And it is because every society <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to give you a brief answer, but I'm going to invite you to, to search for the answer. And it's serious and it's important that it, there is a search, because this is another thing that's been lied about, maligned, distorted. Not a surprise in a capitalist society that's threatened by this. Um, the, the fundamental problem in the world today, at the base of everything, is that, or the most defining thing about human societies, is we have to reproduce the requirements of life. Food, clothing, shelter. 
new generations have to be reared. Every society, every human society, that's the most fundamental thing about it. We live today, and then culture grows up on that foundation, belief systems, relations, ideas, moralities flow out of and reflect that. Today we live in a capitalist imperialist society where the fundamental contradiction of this world, for the first time in human history, is not that there's scarcity. There's enough to meet the needs of all of humanity, to feed, clothe, shelter, and to have a lively and enriched intellectual, cultural, and social life for everybody too. The only reason it doesn't happen is that the massive means of production, the networks of, of production and transport and communication and technology, they are worked by millions, socially, billions come together to work to produce all of these things. But what is produced is owned privately by capitalist imperialist, uh, by capitalists enforced by a capitalist imperialist system and backed up by laws that are enforced by armies and police. So you have the abundance, but it's privately appropriated and that's enforced by a state. By overthrowing that state, by overthrowing that system, by implementing a radically different system, you can un unleash those same networks of production, those, that same productive capacity in a different way towards meeting people's social needs, not towards private appropriation. And you can do it by unleashing the most important resource of all, which is human beings who are thrown away and discarded in their creative capacities. And so socialism on the road to communism is a, is a system that is based on that socialized production for the social well-being of, of the society and the world. And then how you go about running that society and uprooting all the leftovers of this society, how it's trained people to think and act, uh, how you have new laws, how you have new culture, how you have new media, how you have new education, all that and more is spelled out in this constitution. It's very lively, very, including a lot of encouragement for debate and critical evaluation because you need that challenge from every, every direction and everybody participating in that. So it's, it's a bigger answer. To really answer it, you're right, you'd have to put your, but it's a, it's, I'm trying to give you a piece of it and invite you to read this constitution and do hold it up against the U.S. exploiters version, I mean the U.S. exploiters constitution. And also on the website, revcom.us right now, Bob Avakian just republished a piece that breaks down the U.S. constitution and how it is not only written by slave owners but always and can only protect relations of exploitation. It's a very profound piece. I would invite you to dig into that. Come to Louval tomorrow, talk more. It couldn't be a more important question. Um, we'll go here, and then we'll go there. Hi. Uh, I'd like to start by saying I've agreed with a lot of the talk, and a lot of the points were very well placed. Um, but I do have some concerns as to pushing back too much on wokeness and losing some of the potential good. For example, like when it comes to a problem of identity, it's a problem that you, you pit uh, identity politics generally or wokeness against the idea of an objective reality. And what I argue maybe is that an objective reality is something that is is real, right, but is not necessarily easily accessible. And uh, upholding identity can be a useful heuristic towards voices that are necessarily less heard, could be better heard in order to get to a better objective reality. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think another thing is that uh, many people have argued that uh, this idea of stepping out of your safe space. And this is something I fundamentally agree with, that we need to be able to step out of our safe space. But also, I think, as a matter of strategy, there are those who are simply better able to step out of their safe space, and it is when their safe space is not as threatened as others, I think. So if we, I think there is something to be said about recognition that it, there is, it is, hard, it is harder for someone who is more oppressed to step out of their safe space. And I think that's something that can be overlooked in discussions about the excesses of wokeness, is that space needs to be made for comrades who find it more difficult because of their situation mm -hmm. to step out and learn this reality. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I wanna respond to what you're saying this way. Um, 
It is absolutely the case that there are people, oppressed people, whose voices and experiences have been erased, suppressed, distorted, lied about, and it is profoundly important that we hear those voices and learn from those experiences. That's why I gave the example, I mean, in the speech, there's many that could be given of this woman in Harlem, and I said everybody should learn from that experience. It matters when the parents whose children have been killed by police speak about that and tell and expose that to the world. Everybody should hear those experiences and those voices. And the, and the institutional forces and the cultural forces that have suppressed the voices of the oppressed and the stories of the oppressed and the histories of the oppressed need to be fought against. So that part is very important. But where identity politics and wokeism goes wrong and why it needs to be fought is that it tells you you have to stop there. And that then all you can do is follow the experience of the oppressed. But just because you're oppressed does not mean you know where that oppression comes from, what gave rise to it, how it should be ended, what it will take. Most people have no idea. That takes science for everyone. Now, oppressed people, just like anybody else, can take up the tools of science, but there's a struggle between communism and rationality and scientific thinking on the one hand and wokeism on the other, which is actually not just fails to look beneath the surface, but opposes that. And this is where it does great harm. And you do see people you know, shouting down others, canceling others, refusing to, to look at the evidence they marshal because of their identity. And that's destructive. So that was one part of it. You also raised um, safe spaces. Oh, safe spaces. It is absolutely the case that some people face much higher risk. When Sean Bell was killed by police, most of you are probably, probably way too young. Some of you probably weren't even born. He was shot 50 times on his wedding day in Queens, Jamaica, Queens, black man. Um, when he was killed by police, we went out, the Rev comms went out to the neighborhood that he w was killed in and that he lived in, and we organized people. You were part of that, right? Noche Diaz was a big part of that, um, to stand up against that. And one of the most striking things at the time was that all these young black women came out, and none of the black men came out, young black men. And as we talked to them, because a lot, they were furious. They hated this, but as we talked to them, they all had uh, charges hanging over them. So if they got picked up, you know, you get picked up at a protest. Maybe if you're a student, it's, it, it's something that's an inconvenience. You want to fight it, but it's not going to threaten your whole life, most likely. But these guys, it could be 15 years. It could be life. It was, it, you know, they're facing charges already. So it was much more risky for them to get involved. And ways did need to be found for them to get involved in the revolution and in this struggle that didn't have the same immediate risks for them. And people who don't face those risks so immediately need to step out there and join that fight, which is why it's so destructive to tell white people, stay in your lane, that's not your place. It's why it's so destructive to tell everybody, don't concern yourself with oppression that doesn't affect you directly. We need a movement of people that is stepping up and taking and putting ourselves on the line, not retreating from it. So those unevennesses... Those unevennesses are very real and very profound, and we have to have the maturity to traverse them together. But the goal cannot be realized of safe space for anybody in this system. And so while we should take into account those unevennesses and people need to put it on the line and take greater risk where they have more ability to do so, everybody has to put it on the line in one way or the other because this world, there are things bigger than one's safety much bigger than, than any individual safety. And in, you know, in the struggles Bob Avake and I quoted from him, in any real struggle against real oppression, people stand up and they sacrifice. There are many Black Panther Party leaders and fighters who gave their lives. There are many people in the fight in the, for civil rights who gave their lives, and it was right. There were many people who gave their lives in 2020 uprising against the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and it was a righteous thing. It was a, it was a life given that had meaning. We don't want that to happen, but that's because of the system that we live under that carries out this terror and repression. That violence is on them. And if we want that to stop, we can't hide from it. We have to get them off this system, off the face of the earth, and off the backs of humanity. Because every day that they go on, millions and millions of people 
1.9 million people in the prisons have no safe space. The millions of women who are pregnant and desperate right now in Kentucky and Texas and Florida, they don't have a safe space. So we have to step out of our comfort zones. And while we do that, we take into account these differences. But safe space as a goal is bankrupt, and it is an illusion. Because there is no safe space in a nuclear war. There is no safe space in a fascist America. And that's where we're headed. So we have to, we have to lift our sights, and we have to become much more daring. Um, this guy right here. Hello. So my first question is, why do you think wokeism, whatever you want to call it, uh, became the dominant way of thinking about these issues mm -hmm. compared to you know, something else? Was it just luck, or was there something inevitable about you know, yeah. wokeism that, uh, or yeah, was there something inherent in wokeism that kind of just made it inevitable? Mm -hmm. uh, and then my second question is, what is your guys' take on artificial intelligence and its its impact? Like, has it had any change and has it caused any change in the way that you think about your movement at all? Because it's, it's going to kill a lot of jobs. <laughs> That's true. Um, so, uh, on AI, I am going to say, if anybody wants to, we should do a salon and a chat sometime about it. We could have an open space. We could do a Zoom. We could find a way to explore it. I'd love to hear people's thinking on it. We are also processing how to understand this. There's a lot of learning going on in this. I'm not prepared to make a global statement about it, except that it is a profound change that we have to learn more about. Um, on your other question about why is wokeism the dominant form of of thinking and accommodation among the decent people? Was it inevitable? Where did it come from? Was it accident? I think it was neither total accident nor was it inevitable. Um, but I think there are at least two major, two, maybe three, or maybe two bit major reasons I could point to. One is that there has been, for quite some time, a rejection of and it, it corresponds with the defeat of revolutions in the last, in the, in the first stage of communist revolutions and of the revolutionary upsurges of the 1960s here and around the world. When those were defeated and people's sights were lowered, one of the things that people reached for instead and that got institutionalized in academia and in other places is a lot of relativism, identity politics, and postmodernism, which is again anti-scientific and anti-revolutionary. And this got, somebody shouted out, and I don't know where they're coming from, but they said it got institutional backing. It did. It's not the only thing that got institutional backing. So did a lot of really like right-wing fascist things. But this also got institutional backing. And so this has been the indoctrinated outlook for, for, for several generations now of, of you proceed from your identity, you proceed from you, standpoint epistemology, everybody has their own truth, there's no objective reality, or maybe there is, but you can never know it objectively. So all of this has been brewing, and then um, it combines with just the tremendous, profound parasitism of this country that feasts on and sits on the people of the world. I talk about where our clothes are made, where our food comes from, where the coltan in our cell phones come from, where it's assembled. This is global networks of exploitation and oppression. And you're sitting atop the food chain in this country. And you might care, and you might want to do something about it, but you're pretty comfortable. And doing something about it means you have to go up against real things. You have to struggle. You have to sacrifice. You have to put it on the line. And so this became a very, very convenient way of saying, I'm doing something, I'm changing words, I'm changing my tiny space. But you're sitting there cushioned and, and, and hiding from the larger thing. So there's a lot of American chauvinism, a lot of American parasitism, a lot of American privilege, which is also why the wokesters never talk about American privilege and never fight against it. So this is, but it's, it, so these are two big things that came together. And I guess the third I will say is that we are now, especially in this time of rapid change, of, as he said, uh, pre-Civil War conditions in this country, of the country ripping apart in major ways, of major laws and changes in society, the, the fascists are armed to the teeth and preparing for and hungering for a civil war and a purge of all those that they deem subhuman. 
black people, immigrants, women who are uppity, LGBT people, trans people, they're speaking in genocidal terms and they're deadly serious. And in the face of that, there's an even greater freak out among the decent when they don't have the scientific tools they need and they don't know that there is actually a different way the world could be. They don't know about the revolutionary way out. They don't know about the new society that's possible. They don't know about the revolutionary leader, Bob Avakin, who spent 50 years forging this science and putting himself to figuring out how we could actually win a revolution, what we would replace this with learning from the past struggles to do better, including the approach to science. And so they don't know this, so they are even more freaking out and, and, and getting this, you know, I described the dynamic where the more that the fascists lash out, the more the wokesters freak out and, and get more and more fanatical and the decent people get silent in the middle. But we have to change that. And I think right now, and I don't know how much longer we want to go, but I want to say right now, it is not only extremely destructive, the fascists love this woke shit. They love the way the decent people are cannibalizing each other and are soft prey, easy kill. Steve King, the fascist former congressman from Iowa, Bob Avakian quoted him in a tweet. He said, look, a lot of people are talking about civil war these days. Well, one side has eight trillion bullets and the other side can't figure out what bathroom to use. Now that has a lot of anti-trans slander that's fucked up, but unfortunately there's too much truth to it too where our side is, is caught up in a lot of in, like bullshit, easy prey, easy kill. And we have to change this. We have to change this rapidly. And I believe not only is there a heightened need, but in this time of great convulsive change, when a lot of questions are being forced upon people, we have the opportunity to change this rapidly. And that's what we're trying to do with this speaking tour. We're trying to take it on head on not just on this campus and then another campus and then another campus. We want this to become a pole in society for all the people who feel sad on and who really want to know a way out. And we want to fight to spread this tour, to spread the news of this revolution, to spread this is a whole breakdown of what the revolution's about and the mechanism for making it. And on the back, it has these resources. This needs to get out by the millions. And everybody here needs to play a role in it, learning, spreading it. It says. Watch the interviews we did with Bob Avakian. You've never seen a revolutionary leader like this. The heart, the humanity, the humor, the hardcore determination to make a revolution, the farsightedness, the vision. This is an incredible interview. Watch it. it. Says about who he is. Get with the Revolution Club. It has connecting material. This We have to take this everywhere, and we have to take this tour everywhere, because there's a moment where when the rulers are divided, we could actually have a go at bringing forward the people to bring this system down. And so that's, you asked about wokeism and what led to it, and I'm describing that, but I'm also saying the very conditions that led wokeism to go kind of out of control hysterical right now, both require and make possible, those same conditions make possible this revolution growing in a out of control way too, but only if we fight for it now. So that's my challenge to everybody here. Um, it's a, uh, okay, by the crowd, we had a lot of people trickle out, but those of you who are here, should we take a few more? I want to make sure there's time for mingle and, and talking, but if, are most people sticking around? Would you pick, you pick. Okay. Okay, so. Go ahead, go ahead, ask your question. You who's complaining. Okay. I understand, but pick you know one, there's a lot of hands. Go ahead. Go ahead. You need the mic. Get him the mic. No, 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 the mic. <laughs> Just, will you come to the aisle so that she could get the mic to you? My question is, how does abortion liberate women when the vast majority of abortions are done in order to further their careers or education, used just to get careers and be enslaved by corporations, or be slaves to their sexual urges, like the sex work supporters that you mentioned, in place of the slavery that you were talking about? That's a fabulous question. Um, I'm trying to remember your question. I just uh, did not like, okay. What, how does abortion 
Help women, it means that women are not chattel, they're not baby-making machines, they're not incubators. They're full human beings, and being a full human being, sexuality is part of that. Being a parent, if you choose to be, is a part of that. It can be a beautiful part of it if you want to be. But being forced to have a child against your will is like being forced to have sex against your will. It's akin to being rape. It is violent control over a woman's body and her life by a patriarchal male-dominated society. And a woman should have the right to an abortion on demand without apology for any reason she chooses. And I will add, and I will add, hold on, hold on, you want me to answer? I will Rape add. Rape is not the only cause. What? Rape is not the no, only no, no. cause for women to get Okay, please, please. Yeah, 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 yeah. The vast majority of abortions are not caused by rape. I, I didn't claim that. I know maybe you're nervous and you didn't hear me fully. I said forcing a woman. No, seriously, forcing a woman to have a child against her will is akin to rape. Is akin to rape. It's violent control of women. I did not say most abortions are caused by rape. Most abortions are caused because a woman is pregnant and doesn't want to be. And I will tell you there are many. Hold on. Hold on, there are many, many, okay, I'm sorry, there are many, many good reasons to have a child, but being pregnant is not one of them. Being pregnant is not a good reason to have a child. Having your birth control fail is a stupid reason to have a child. Being horny and hooking up with somebody is not a sin, it's not enslavement, and it's not a good reason to have a child. Okay, this woman who really, really, really wanted me to call on you, go ahead and call on this area, bring her the mic. Yeah, you, stand up, but wait for the mic. Wait for the mic. Okay, so um, when you said that we need a communist government because you wanted everyone to have food, housing, and clothing, I'm just wondering under like any communist government if there's ever been a situation where everyone's had food, housing, and clothing because like last I've seen, most communist governments, people have starved to death and they've come here. And I've talked to many, many people, right, who've experienced that and they fled. Why are people fleeing from communist governments to here if they're not being fed, right? Why did millions of people starve under Mao? You told me Mao was your favorite of all. So why were tens of millions of people starved to death? That's my question. Okay, so I... Actually, the goal of communism is not to have everybody have food, clothing. No, I said at the foundation of any society, people have to organize themselves through one mode of production or another to meet the material requirements of life. People have clothing and people have food, and people have shelter in every human society that continues to reproduce. That's been done under feudalism, it's been done under slavery, it's been done under socialism, it's been done under capitalism. The question is, is it done through means of exploitation and plunder that leave the vast majority of humanity behind, or is it done to meet the needs of society as a whole and enrich their cultural, intellectual lives? And under socialism and genuine communism, the massive means of production that today are used to make profit for a handful, while the majority of humanity toils, yes, look at the Congo, look at the children there, see if they have clothing, see what the rags they wear, see where they sleep at night, see what kind of food, clothing, and shelter this system gives to the masses of people who are crossing the Darien Gap right now because of what the US did to this planet. The thousands who are fleeing from Afghanistan because of the U.S.'s war there to Brazil, up through South America on foot over the Darien Gap, by foot, risking their lives, the Haitians coming. Where are these people coming from? Why are they coming to this country? Because this country, to quote Baba Bacon, has fucked up the rest of the world even worse than they've done to this country. Okay. Okay, so we are gonna take this last question over here and we are gonna call it an evening and invite you guys to talk and stick around. Um, last question over here. And uh, in the, in the um, plaid. Somebody is laughing that I'm mad. Yes, I do care and I'm passionate because I do not think it's okay to make peace with 
massive exploitation and suffering. I have no shame about being upset about that. Triggered. It's not triggered. I'm quite rational at the same time. Go ahead. Okay. The revolutionary communists I spoke to this week said Lenin was a great leader whose vision was ruined by Stalin, but didn't explain how they would prevent an authoritarian takeover. The Soviet Union had an arguably better constitution than the U.S. does while totally failing to uh, actually uphold basic liberties. How would you prevent a future communist society from turning into a brutal authoritarian dictatorship like China and the USSR? Um, the best answer is to read this. There is, first of all, there's a lot of distortion on the actual history of communist revolution, which was profoundly liberating and emancipating. And for those who want to know, life expectancy in China in 1949, when they made that revolution, life expectancy for nearly a billion people was 32 years old. Because medicine, health care, and food that was grown was all funneled to the cities to a very tiny sliver of colonial oppressors and a ruling elite in China. And through that revolution, they changed the conditions of life so that life expectancy was 65. They more than doubled it. Before that revolution was reversed. Before that revolution was reversed, which is today a capitalist hellhole. So there were profoundly liberating things done by Lenin, done by Mao in those revolutions. But what I am fighting for is not to return to those societies, but to learn from them and build on them. And Bob Avakian has done that, and he's forged a new communism, which is written in here. And so I would invite you. I would invite you. So because I'm upholding a book, it means I'm upholding a Bible. This is like the lowest level of argument. Wait a second. <laughs> yeah, said the guy with the Burger King clown. Okay. Um, my point is this. If you're serious and you want to know how we would do better, it's a very, there are very deep answers. It's not a 20-second soundbite. You know... The, 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 Mao did not kill 40 million. These are, you know, you have to, you're talking about communist history the way people were, the Gone with the Wind teaches the history of the Civil War. No, seriously. 600,000 people died in the U.S. Civil War. Did Lincoln slaughter them? No, this was a war fought to end slavery. It was a war that was to overthrow people who were being held in bondage by violence, okay? overthrow the people who were holding others in bondage. In Maoist China, he did not kill 40 million. There were, there were famines, but actually Mao transformed that agricultural society to overcome famines and hunger for the first time in Chinese history. He did. And then there were shortcomings in the way he made that revolution, but profoundly liberating things he achieved, and Bob Avakian has studied and learned from it, and yes, he wrote it in a book. Imagine that. Imagine that. And I will uphold this book in a document, and I will challenge any of you to measure this one against the U.S. exploiters' vision of freedom in their constitution, which has led to, by design, not by something they overcame, but by design has led to over 70 invasions of Latin America, plunder around the globe, and now they are hurtling our planet and everyone on it towards environmental catastrophe that could be the end of human civilization. So measure this system that we live under and are trapped within against this and debate it and find out what's possible and spread the word about it and let's get into it and let's learn the real history of the actual genuinely liberating socialist revolutions on an evidence-based approach because there's a lot to learn from, positive, overwhelmingly, and shortcomings, like there isn't anything that people endeavor for the first time. There's a learning curve in communism too, but the biggest mistake and the biggest crime would be to throw the whole thing away and to settle for this horrific nightmare of a society when something far better is possible. Yes. I think we need to end it. So, uh, I want to... Thank everyone for coming, and everyone, let's give a, another round of applause to Sansara Taylor.
And we can, uh, we will continue the conversation tomorrow, 5 p.m. at Laval Commons. And to everyone, particularly the people who were moved by this presentation, by this speech, who want to learn more and talk to us, we're going to stick around for a little bit and mingle. Thank you. The first episode. That there is the a RAF way out of all that oppresses people here and around. We need a revolution. Around. Anything else and a final analysis is bullshit. This is a show about revolution. The, the whole damn system! To get organized for an actual revolution. Break all the chains! We have to make a revolution. George Floyd was murdered. To protect this planet. The right to abortion nationwide hangs in the balance. Nuclear warfare. The world is running out of time. What makes the RNL show the most important program on the internet is that we bring the way out of this madness through a real revolution.